to Hasp. Um, Jordan has been hailed by critics as a saxophone powerhouse with a penchant for modern swinging melodican. He holds degrees from Central Michigan University, the University of Michigan, and the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. His current position is the Director of Jazz Studies at Northeastern State University, into which he has just moved to Oklahoma and is in the middle of getting settled in his new office. Jordan records for Origin Records and his newest project is planned for release in 2024. Today we'll be continuing with the music of John Coltrane, uh, focusing on his creative output during the 1960s with his quartet. Welcome back, Jordan. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's good to be here. Um, looks like my, my screen sharing is kind of paused, which is really fun and exciting. Uh, and it's almost as fun and exciting as it is to be here. Um, let's see. This is just very strange. Um, well, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is just kind of um, go through uh, my presentation and and hopefully you don't mind being a little bit out of sorts here. I just don't want to uh, waste any more time here. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for your patience. Um, I'm actually in my new office at uh, Northeastern State University. And um, along with that, uh, I had to plug in my computer and was looking around and I was like, wait, where is there an outlet in here? And it like there was like one outlet in the whole thing. Anyway, it was this this whole thing. Um, yeah, so we're going to be focusing today on the classic quartet era and, and the uh, Atlantic Records era of John Coltrane's output. Um, and there's a lot to say here, and I personally find this uh, uh, just to be one of the most exciting uh, places of output for Coltrane because I really feel like he starts coming into his own as a band leader uh, and, and also as a saxophonist during this area. So um, during this era, rather, uh, mis misspoke. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great to see everybody again. Um, as a reminder, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat or just unmute and ask as the presentation goes along. Um, I don't mind being interrupted, um, so please don't, don't hesitate. I love hearing from all of you all, and um, if I didn't, I just, I mean, I wouldn't be back here, so. Um, now, last time we were talking about Blue Train, uh, the iconic Coltrane record, and um, it kind of begs the question, where do we go from here? Coltrane is starting to come into his own as a composer, and he's starting to uh, kind of unleash uh, uh, his saxophone um, prowess, and a lot of that comes with virtuosity, and I think that might have been Louis last week, who had said, yeah, Coltrane can just bury you with notes. Um, and that's true, he really can. So we're going to go into 1959 to 1961, the Atlantic Records era. Now, typically here, um, there are some characteristics of this particular era of Coltrane. Um, but the most important things that happened, first of all, this is what we would consider Coltrane's Giant Steps era. Um, this is when the famous composition Giant Steps comes on the scene. We'll explain that a little bit more later. And if you haven't heard uh, of Coltrane's Giant Steps, um, we will, I mean, we will certainly uh, talk about it in a little bit more detail. Second, uh, he forms the Classic Quartet. And with this, two really important records come out, uh, My Favorite Things and the 1964 Surprise record, which is kind of what I like to call it, uh, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll get into that a little bit later, uh, Coltrane Sound, which is one of my favorite uh, Coltrane records, but it's often unheralded in the shadow of such recordings as Giant Steps. Now, uh, he also introduces the soprano saxophone to his repertoire. Pre uh, previously, we know that he shifted his focus from alto saxophone to tenor saxophone. 
Well, in, in this particular era, he adds the soprano saxophone. He doesn't stop playing the tenor, but he adds the soprano, and we'll talk about why that is kind of an interesting development and how he was a trendsetter in that way. Well, maybe not trendsetter is the right word, but eh, trailblazer, let's call him. So, first I want to go over a rare video that we have from this period. And I want to set it up with a little bit of background information. Train was touring Europe for the very first time as a member of the Miles Davis Quintet in 1960. Now, while he was on that particular tour, it was right after he had recorded Giant Steps for Atlantic Records. While he was on that tour, a couple important things happened. First of all, he was allowed to do a few gigs as a quartet, uh, as a leader. Now, he had just released a, his first quartet record, so the chance that he had to really capitalize on that was huge for Coltrane. So, of course, he takes a gig, uh, a couple gigs, actually, um, with the Miles Davis Quintet Rhythm Section, Wynton Kelly, Paul Chambers, and Jimmy Cobb. Now, fatefully, J Miles Davis bought Coltrane during this trip a soprano saxophone. He bought it for Coltrane. It was a gift. And it was very rare soprano saxophone uh, in the 1950s, uh, with the exception of Steve Lacey. Um, it was previously associated with earlier jazz, and particularly the musician who really brought the soprano saxophone to uh, prominence in early jazz was Sidney Bechet. Um, but there were musicians in the 40s and 50s that were kind of staying away from the soprano um, just because it was seen as a bit more of an old school kind of instrument. Um, luckily for us, Coltrane liked old school and he was okay with that. And then he kind of made it current school slash new school. Again, we'll get into that later. So I want to start off with kind of this question before we watch the video, again, which I think the video is kind of fascinating. Um, in what ways do you hear Coltrane pushing the boundaries of jazz at this time, even when considered uh, to his own output? Think back to Blue Train and, and uh, other things. Um, you know, your answer doesn't have to be terribly technical. It's totally fine. You don't have to use um, sophisticated terminology. Uh, it's really just what you hear. And then lastly, this is just a question to kind of appease my own curiosities. Did you enjoy this? Why or why not? And don't be afraid to say that the answer is no. I understand that as you move progressively throughout Coltrane's uh, repertoire, some of it becomes a little bit less... Uh, kind of for the people and kind of less um, uh, palatable, shall we say. And that's kind of uh, a little bit on purpose. So um, anyway, without further ado, here's John Coltrane in Europe. I believe this gig is from Dusseldorf, um, Germany. And uh, hope you enjoy On Green Dolphin Street, the classic jazz standard.
stop sharing for just a second. Um, all right. So what did you think of that recording here with video of John Coltrane in 1960, Dusseldorf, Germany? I believe the, um, the Apollo Theater is where it was. Ironically, not that Apollo Theater, but the one in, in Germany. No one. <clears throat> this is Louis. Hi, Louis. Hello. I found that um, that was very accessible, palatable, different from what was being done before, perhaps. But and again, we have 60 years of hindsight. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, I, I, I am not a great fan of dissonance or mm -hmm. atonal music. And some of the people in the 60s were experimenting with that, and it's still present today. But uh, I didn't find that to be any of that. I found that to be perhaps less melodic, but certainly very accessible. Less melodic, but very accessible. Very good, uh, uh, Louis. That's very well put. You could, that could be on um, like the the press quote for this uh, this outing. Nice. Uh, any any other thoughts here? I have a thought. If you can hear me. Yes. Yes, I can. I intentionally listened to the performance with my eyes closed. Oh, very cool. Which, which, which heightens perception of what you hear. Absolutely, yeah. And as I was listening, I was imagining the mechanical operation of the keys of a saxophone, uh -huh. the acoustics of how saxophone makes that sound, mm -hmm. and then the brain science in Coltrane's head of how he activated all of that. Absolutely. That's, you know, those are all great things to, uh, uh, you know, to think about. And I'm wondering if you have any kind of takeaways from that, then thinking about all of those things. Well, the takeaway is immersed in something you delightfully explained last week about Philadelphia sound. Yeah, it really is. You, you, you get that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Um, all right, any other uh, takeaways uh, from the class here? Um, any other thoughts on this recording? All right. Well, you know, something that I want to point out about improvisation in this era is that the solos that musicians were taking were now getting far longer. And you, what that meant was that we still had two sides of an LP, right? Two sides of a vinyl record. But what was happening is you could have, excuse me, you could have two tunes, two compositions, two selections on one side of a record, and that's it. Whereas before you would be able to fit just a few more on there, but really what was happening is is you had you know these this recording technology that um again i i want to share the anecdote that I, I have students who ask well why are there only five tunes on this record and it's like well you have to remember it's two sides of an lp two on one side and and three on the other so um <clears throat> yeah so you had um things like these really honestly the musicians are stretching out a lot more and this is where some people at the time now again i want to remind you we do have you know 60 some years of hindsight to our benefit but at the time audiences didn't always know what to do with long solos like that some people aficionados really did enjoy it and they did like you know, hearing musicians, you know, go off um, on on long journeys, melodic or otherwise. Other times you had people who really didn't enjoy the improvisation focused atmosphere. And particularly you would find this kind of opposition from people who were very attached to the swing era. Because in the swing era, you had a lot of things that you could hold on to. You had songs with uh, shorter forms, maybe a, form would, uh, a song would be three to four minutes. 
sometimes if you were thinking about the great American songbook, you'd have, you know, um, my goodness, you'd have words, lyrics, you know, to hang on to. Not so here. And because of that, there was a certain perception of musicians of this era that they were alienating to their audiences. Now, I really can't imagine Coltrane's intent being to alienate an audience because of how deeply spiritual he was due to his upbringing uh, as the child and grandchild of, of two uh, AME preachers. But um, at the certain uh, standpoint, from a certain standpoint, there were critics out there you know, who were saying that because of all the notes and the flurries of notes, uh, that Coltrane sounded angry. Uh, and, and he responded to those comments saying, no, 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 I just have so much that I want to say. And I have so much in that I'm trying to do with the saxophone. Um, and I always found that very interesting because critics' perceptions of musicians and our perceptions of ourselves can often be well, in extreme cases, they can be diametrically opposed, right? But at the very least, sometimes they're just a bit incongruent. So, um, may, may I interrupt about too many notes? A hundred percent. Yeah, go ahead. The, that was the, the King's comment on Mozart's music. Yeah, that's right. And how do we perceive Mozart now? Do we think of it as too many notes now? I think of it as mathematics in a musical form. Yeah, mathematics in a musical form. I like it. And there is there's a certain element of math because of how, you know, evenly you can divide pitches uh, into things. But yeah, Mozart. Um, and it, it's funny. I always think of Mozart as a. Uh, I mean, his, his melodies are so to me singable and vocal and. Um, especially, but, uh, you know, again, it's all about your perspective because I mean, I grew up listening to the Mozart piano sonatas over and over and over again. And that, um, so to me, it's kind of like, oh, it's normal. But of course that King, the King was not really, um, able to do that. <laughs> he didn't quite have that benefit. Um, at any rate, continuing on, I want to give you some, some background on giant steps. Now, Giant Steps, again, is often considered to be Coltrane's greatest musical accomplishment, his magnum opus, if you will. Uh, I don't think Coltrane really agreed with that. I think that given the... Um, because if he did think that, I think he would have just stopped. But the thing is, Coltrane was somebody who was always searching, always trying to find his next avenue, musically speaking. And because of that, he took giant steps and expanded on the ideas of harmony that, um, that he created in, in the song form itself. So Giant Steps was released uh, on Atlantic in 1960, February of 1960, that is. And it consisted of three other main musicians other than Coltrane himself. And that's Paul Chambers on the bass, Tommy Flanagan on piano, and Art Taylor on the drums. Now, interestingly enough, Cedar Walton and Lex Humphreys uh, on piano and drums, respectively, were also included on these, uh, on these alternate takes. And, you know, you've all seen this happen. You have a record that the original pressing goes over very well, and so people say, well, let's see, hear all the alternate takes and see what you have there. Um, now, the reason Cedar Walton and Lex Humphreys were only included on the alternate takes is that the first session uh, was um, March 28, 1959. But Coltrane, um, he, he decisively hated that session. He th didn't think it was good enough. He was dissatisfied with it musically. And particularly, though he acknowledged that Walton and Humphreys were great musicians. They were not the right musicians for this project. And so Coltrane wanted to basically just throw out the session, 
and he said, "All right, cool. Um, let's let's figure something else out here." So we experimented with rhythm sections uh, and experimented with who he wanted to be on the project. And so, again, like I said, he had just finished up Kind of Blue and he was, uh, and so two weeks after that, uh, he took Winton Kelly and Jimmy Cobb uh, with Paul Chambers into the session and they recorded uh, the take of Naima that you hear on the on the project. And of course this gives the rhythm section a decisively different flavor. Uh, but he also decided that maybe he wasn't gonna use that either. And so then he recorded on the second and also the fifth um, with Tommy Flanagan and Art Taylor on the drums, and this is the rhythm section that Coltrane really decided that he wanted to go with. So it's interesting to me because a lot of people, um, we just, we hear the virtuosic solos, but we don't ever know, well, and maybe I am, I am per a person who takes it for granted then, uh, we don't necessarily think of what it took to get there. We don't necessarily think of Coltrane being unhappy with his own work because, again, hindsight, we know him as one of the greatest saxophonists of all time. But to get there, you know, um, he had to really, he had to be picky. He had to push himself. And, and Giant Steps is an example of him doing just that. So we're going to listen to the title track of Giant Steps, um, and what you're going to hear is some extreme virtuosity. Um, now, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I did say that solos were getting longer. This particular song, song form is 16 measures long. All right? It's at a very brisk tempo, and uh, Coltrane, let's just say he... If, if, if taking choruses of solo were uh, pieces of pie, Coltrane does have his fill here. Um, so this is the title track of the great recording Giant Steps. Um, and I just want you to really kind of bask in Coltrane's virtuosity here. Something I want to point out about this that, again, a lot of people might not necessarily think of, but Coltrane was kind of famous for bringing in tunes that he had practiced for a long time, that he had written, and that he was very used to playing over, and as a result, uh, he wasn't always as sympathetic to people uh, complaining about that modus operandi. Of course, this was the case on uh, Moments Notice from the Blue Train recording when C Curtis Fuller famously or perhaps infamously named the tune uh, based on uh, his saying, 
John, what are you doing? I can't play this tune at a moment's notice. I can't play these changes at a moment's notice. Um, similarly, Tommy Flanagan had an issue on this uh, on this record, and he again famously or perhaps infamously takes maybe the worst solo of his career. And I can imagine him saying, "Wait, no, 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 no! You're not going to use that, right? Because that's what people would do." Um, if they were in these days, if they were in Flying Against Choice, they would they would say to the band leader, "You're not using this." Um, unfortunately, Flanagan did not have that choice, and and uh, the record got issued anyway. But at this breakneck tempo, you can kind of hear in it that Flanagan is is struggling a little bit because his comping, his piano uh, voicings of the chords are really staccato and they're very short and they're very they sound really frantic. Um, I want you to listen to this again um, when Coltrane starts soloing and listen to how frantic the piano sounds. You know what? You also hear him playing a lot of the same piano voicings over and over. You hear him voicing the chords in almost the same way where they appear every single time. And that's because, you know, it's that muscle memory thing, you know? He's trying to get it so that his hands are going to the right place. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of the these voicings, he's playing the same rhythms over and over again. You know, it's interesting to hear he's just a hair behind where Art Taylor is on the drums, where he's putting the time. Um, so that being said, Tommy Flanagan, he has a really interesting outing on this, uh, this tune. By interesting, I mean um, all I can think of when I hear it is, oh man, poor Tommy Flanagan. interesting you can hear Coltrane come right back in and take another solo uh, over the the tune um, uh, but Flanagan his improvisation is kind of stilted and and it's like this whole uh, he's having trouble making the same connections that Coltrane is making like it being as fluid you know say what you will about how fast he's playing but Coltrane is fluid over this tune. Again, he wrote it, so I would hope so, but um, this was not perhaps Tommy Flanagan's finest hour. So Coltrane, um, it's important for Coltrane, but it's also important for jazz in general because 
jazz in general at this point kind of leans on the power of the the fourth or the fifth all right that by that i mean the the musical interval of the fourth or the fifth and basically what's happening is um well hold on one second um so you're you're going through this thing um and what's happening is um uh Jazz at the time is a lot based on the major chord and then what we call the 2-5-1 progression, which sounds like this. And a lot of tunes would kind of go... Or they'd go... Um, And that's how they would uh, come to a musical resting point and, and cadence. Now, interestingly enough, what Giant Steps does is Giant Steps goes, instead of in fifths like this, uh, Giant Steps goes in thirds. So instead, one second here. Um, Instead of doing that, what Giant Steps does is <laughs> Giant Steps goes in thirds, and so what you hear when you hear Giant Steps is this. So, um, oh, one, one second here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. You hear this. So... We're, first of all, we're in a weird key. We're in B major. And then all of a sudden we go up a third. So from here to here. So what happens is um, you're in three keys here. B major, first B major, then he goes to E flat, and then he goes uh, to B major again, and then he goes to E flat again, and then he goes to G major. So the way these chords are related kind of form this, all right? And the, the main thing here, the main takeaway, is just that we're moving in a very unconventional way. And instead of having just one key center like most tunes at the time, he has three. <laughs> so what that leads to, what it leads to happening is that you are not ever in one place for very long. And what that leads you to is it leads it to feel very unsettled, um, both from a harmonic standpoint and because it's so fast from a rhythmic standpoint, all right? So we have a whole host of, of kinds of issues. Now, like I said, the solos are getting longer and far more virtuosic, uh, with the exception of Tommy Flanagan's solo, No Shade to Tommy Flanagan. Now, it's really the first iconical, uh, or iconical, <laughs> it's the first iconic example of Coltrane's distinctive voice on the saxophone, but also as a composer. Giant Steps, now I'm talking about the record, not the tune. Um, it consists of his compositions, and, and they're all incredibly iconic songs. So here you have Mr. PC, you have Sita's Song Flute, you have Naima, and really he kind of comes into his own um, uh, on this. Now, here's a kind of a Vox video that explains a little bit more about Giant Steps here. Um. 
This is which. Coltrane wrote these unique chord changes for Giant Steps and later went on to use them over traditional jazz standards. These chords came to be known as the Coltrane Changes, and improvising over them is considered a rite of passage for jazz musicians. But if you don't understand a lick of music theory like me, it's really hard to see how this is so legendary. Lucky for me, I know two people that could explain why. Braxton Cook. Okay, <laughs> I did the, okay, you caught me off guard with that. And Adam Neely. Should I get into the like technical jargony stuff? Let's cut to the logo first. <laughs> Giant Steps recording that really illustrates just how demanding this song is. It happens when Tommy Flanagan, the pianist on the record, starts his solo. The story goes, John Coltrane brought in the music, you know, he shows up. And then it goes down, it's like one of the most legendary recordings of all time. That's messed up. I would want another shot, you know, I'd be like, bro, don't put that recording out. To understand why this was so difficult for even a highly trained pianist, we need to know three basic concepts. And it all starts with this, the circle of fifths. It's kind of like a color wheel for music. Okay, awesome. You glued this stuff and everything, this is fire. All 12 notes of the Western musical scale are on it, but you might notice they're a little mixed up. That's because they're organized by a very special number in music, a fifth. What's a fifth? It's like if we were in the C major scale, we go C, D, E, F, G, right? One, two, three, four, five. From C to G is five notes, from G to D is five notes, and, well, you get the idea. If you play through the circle, you'll traverse the entire keyboard, starting on the lowest C, and ending up on the highest C. It sounds much more harmonious than just playing all the notes in order. That's because... The fifth is a sound that our ears just like. Uh, please explain. Whenever we're hearing anything, whenever we're hearing people sing, whenever we're hearing people play music, we're hearing these other notes, these overtones, alongside the pitches that they're playing. When I play this C, the first two loudest tones that are pushed through the air are both C. One is just an octave higher. But other tones travel to our ears as well. The third loudest is a G, which happens to be a fifth above C. In 1973, Leonard Bernstein demonstrated this phenomenon live on a grand piano at Harvard. Listen closely after he hits that note. What do we hear now? That G, right? A new tone, again clear as a bell. You want to hear it again? These overtones are kind of like subliminal tones that you're hearing alongside a regular note. And you're hearing these overtones everywhere. A lot of Western music is based on the power of the fifth, especially how it relates so strongly back to its home chord. In the case of the key of C major, we have the G chord resolving to C. If we're thinking about what the G chord represents, it represents kind of tension. You want this to resolve. And when it finally does resolve, it creates this feeling of finality. It creates a feeling of home. That five-to-one relationship is present in a lot of chord progressions, including the most common one found in jazz, the two-five-one. The two-five-one essentially is like... So that's why we really like the two-five-one progression, and it's why a lot of jazz is based on it. Now, here, Tommy Flanagan kind of redeems himself. I believe this is 1982. It's a tribute to John Coltrane, so all the tunes are Coltrane tunes. And here's Flanagan playing over Giant Steps again.
so you hear Flanagan is immediately more conversational. He's more fluid on this uh, rendition. Um, now, granted, it is a lot slower than Coltrane's recording. But also, I mean, come on, the changes are really hard. So, like, I mean, that is a, actually a tempo closer to what you would hear it uh, at a jam session or something. So I just, I, did, I didn't want to trash on Tommy Flanagan too badly. He did the best he could, given the fact that Train brought in the, uh, the tune on the day of the session. Um, <clears throat> so now we have the classic quartet. And so something about this um, classic quartet that is so important, um, it, where Coltrane starts is uh, fellow Philadelphian McCoy Tyner uh, with the great bass player Steve Davis and, and also with... Um, uh, wonderful uh, drummer, uh, the great Elvin Jones. Um, so the classic quartet, um, oh my gosh, I actually, I'm so sorry. I think I might have misspoke here. Um, it, it, uh, it's probably Art Taylor, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and uh, no, it is, it is Elvin Jones. Um, Okay, I should really just stop opening my mouth uh, so much here. Okay, so one of the first records that the Classic Quartet recorded was My Favorite Things. And My Favorite Things was a landmark recording for Coltrane because it featured his, it was his first rec record uh, on the soprano saxophone. Remember that soprano saxophone that Miles Davis bought him? Yeah, that one, that same instrument. Now, he was in immediately intrigued by the possibilities. And part of me, and again, this is just conjecture, but part of me thinks that he was so intrigued by it because he originally started his life playing clarinet and alto saxophone. And so I think that there was a little bit of that left in his ears and that he still kind of wanted to hear. Um, and so not that the saxophone, the soprano saxophone and clarinet are terribly similar, uh, but I think that that higher overtone series that like they were talking about in the video is something that really uh, resonated with Coltrane, not to, uh, you know, no pun intended. But um, so here we start with the title track of My Favorite Things. So here uh, this is uh, My Favorite Things from The Sound of Music. Now I want to start with the original Sound of Music uh, kind of recording. And then we're going to talk about the things that Coltrane does to it uh, to make his famous arrangement. Now, when anything bothers me and I'm feeling unhappy, I just try and think of nice things. What kind, kind of things? Thing. Like John Coltrane. Uh, well, nice things nice like John Coltrane. Daffodils. Green meadows. Skies full of stars. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. <laughs> Cream-colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with a moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. <laughs> Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes Snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes Silver white winters that melt into springs These are a few of my favorite things When the dog bites, when the bee stings When I'm feeling sad I simply remember my favorite things And then I don't feel so bad Does it really work? Of course it does. You try it. What things do you like? Pussy willow. Christmas. <laughs> Bunny rabbit. <laughs> so, here we have, I, I want you to think about the lyrics when you think about Coltrane's version, all right? Here you have, basically, um, she's saying, all right, this is what I think of when I'm sad. I just think of all my favorite stuff, all right? Then you have Coltrane's recording, and this record cover is iconic. It has the soprano saxophone, um, again, uh, issued on Atlantic Records. And this is Coltrane's version, 
I want you to think of it. Does it match the lyrics to you? Does it not match the lyrics? And we'll talk about some of his arranging techniques uh, uh, as, it, as it goes. So that's a little bit of my favorite things from John Coltrane. Now, based on the first recording, uh, what do we think about kind of his adherence to the lyrics, or, or do we have any thoughts in general? Oh, this is Frank. Um, hey, I Frank. Think, uh, when I listen to this tune, I always uh, it always harkens back to the original song in the movie. So to me. I feel like it's doing justice to the lyrics in a way, uh, but it goes so much further that uh, it's just, you know, it's so enjoyable with what he does with it. So that's just my overall reaction to that. I love it. Yeah. It just uh, honors it, but takes it a step further. Very nice. Yeah. Any other thoughts here on my favorite things? All right, so my favorite things. Very interesting recording uh, because it's showing Coltrane's foray into modal jazz. And really, it, he's done stuff with it before, like his tune Impressions is somewhat similar to the Miles Davis composition, So What? It's the same harmony. Uh, but Coltrane here is is really he's doing some very interesting things and one of the most interesting things that he's doing is what we in music call a pedal point. Um, I'm gonna head over to the piano. By the way, uh, Ian, is the piano coming through clearly this time? Give it a go. Let's try it again, Jordan. 
Okay, is it, I mean, what I'm just saying, was it before? It, it had some issues, but let's try it again one more time. Sure, yeah, so. So, um, <clears throat> great. So, um, <clears throat> what we have going on here is what's called the pedal point. And so I'll use a really simple song that I think maybe some of you all might know. Um, we, it's, uh, <laughs> What the pedal point does is it takes the bass note, which would normally move around a lot, and it makes it static. So for example, if we were to just do this, it changes the character of the song a little bit, so like this. character changes depending on what note and that note's relationship to the melody is. So we could do a pedal like this. Or we could do one like this. This one is an A flat, which is a. It's kind of got this minor ninth that's very dissonant. I won't I won't bother you with that one for too long, but what Coltrane does is he takes everything and he puts it over an E. So. Whoops. So the relationship of the melody to the pedal point changes. And so what happens is, because that pedal, that same note, is used the whole time, what he can do is set up the modes uh, to go along with it. So... And so uh, this is kind of Coltrane's uh, entry into, uh, into modal jazz, and it's through the use of the pedal point. Now, Coltrane, during this time, was obsessed with Indian music. He had studied with Ravi Shankar, the famous uh, Indian classical musician. And so he was all about the pedal point, all right? And so the pedal point became a really important thing to Coltrane, and this is one of his first forays into it. Um, so that's, that's part of what gives his arrangement its distinctive sound, all right? And that's... Um, it's something that he ends up using over and over and over again, literally for the rest of his life, actually. Um, any other closing thoughts on his arrangement of My Favorite Things and, and what he's doing with the soprano saxophone or, or anything of that nature? Everybody's really quiet today. So. Um, anyway. Uh, so, moving on, we have, like I said, one of my favorite Coltrane records, but it has slightly uh, unsavory origins. So, Coltrane's sound was recorded in some of the same sessions as My Favorite Things. Uh, in 1960, in the Atlantic Studios. But it wasn't released until 1964. Now, if you know um, why this was, don't, don't blurt it out. Don't, I will tell you the reason why. But is there anybody who has any guesses about what, 
what might have been going on uh, in uh, in between all this time. Like, why did it take four years for this to get released? Too avant-garde or something? It could be too avant-garde, yeah. Liberia, his song Liberia does kind of go there a little bit, but uh, what what else might it be? Any other guesses? Could there be a, con a contractual problem with Atlantic and other companies? Ah, contractual, we're getting closer. You were getting closer, contractual problems. Or uh, maybe not problems at least not for Atlantic. <laughs> Does this reason for delay have anything to do with the album cover? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, okay. Not the album cover, but that's a really, that's a good point because what do you think of when you think of this album cover? Like, does it have, give you any specific thoughts or feelings or anything? Chaos. Chaos, yeah. So that's clearly a portrait of John Coltrane, right? Okay. Yeah, that's that's John Coltrane, but is it? Uh, I mean, it. He's got something on his face, you know. I see that as extensions of his mind. Yeah, as extensions of his mind. Oh, I like that, Louis. Were you going to say something? I just saw you on mute. Yes, um, it uh, could be the poster for the movie Nightmare in the Atlantic Recording Studios. Nightmare in Atlantic Recording Studios. All right, you heard it here first. Uh, coming in 2023 from John Coltrane, uh, the Nightmare in Atlantic Recording Studios. Yeah, so the, the cover itself even is kind of hinting at what you might hear. Well, interestingly enough, uh, the, basically the recording contracts at the time meant that you got a paid record deal. In other words, the studio would pay for you to make that record. However, because of that, they also owned all of the rights to the masters. That is to say, the actual tapes, like Atlantic Records, as soon as they left John Coltrane's horn, he didn't own them anymore. Atlantic Records did. And so they could do with them whatever they wanted. And so musicians had little to no control over the thing. Uh, wow, uh, little to no control. Sorry about that. Um, Records such as Coltrane Sound were, were released without approval and without input from artists like Coltrane. And so what happened was it was a trade-off. Yes, they would pay you good money to record a record, but at the same time, you didn't own your own music. And that, for a lot of musicians, was just something that they dealt with. In these days, it would be very strange, although not unheard of. Um, not entirely unheard of. If you've heard of all the debacle with Taylor Swift's music um, and her not owning some of her music from Younger, that, that is a kind of a, an after effect of deals like these. Now, the thing is, when you own the masters of the recording, Labels can't do what they want with them. So in other words, the trade-off is in modern recording contracts, particularly with independent labels such as the ones we have today, basically um, artists will pay more to, they'll pay engineer fees, they'll pay the label to host their record, etc., etc., but the artist will usually always retain ownership of those masters. Uh, in these days and age, uh, in this day and age, they're not really so much tapes as they are digital files, all right? But the fact is, Coltrane, when he re was recording for Atlantic, um, he, his popularity was growing in the 60s. And he, Atlantic didn't initially release those pressings, those, those records, or those masters. But what happened was they saw John Coltrane's stock going up. And they said, hey, I bet we could make some money if we, uh, if we released these old Coltrane masters that we had. Because he was popular, but Impulse Records had at that point bought out his contract. And so uh, although Atlantic Records uh, no longer um, 
owned John Coltrane per se. They did own a bunch of his stuff. So what they did was in 1964, they just, they released this collection of recordings. And, um, and that's how Coltrane's sound came about. Now, I want to give you kind of an antithesis to this, uh, this particular session. Um, because the cover looks really crazy. You know, Nightmare and Atlantic Records. But this song is kind of the opposite of that. It's a foil to that, you might say. This is the John Coltrane composition, Central Park West. And um, it's played on soprano saxophone. And what I really love about it is that you can hear his soprano saxophone playing mature. And you can hear his harmonic concept, concept mature. Now, this um, is using the Coltrane changes. Um, and I like to refer to it when I'm taught, introducing it to students as uh, giant steps really, really slow or giant steps in ballad form. So this is Central Park West performed on the soprano saxophone from the Atlantic Records uh, release, uh, an unheralded masterpiece, Coltrane Sound. Oh, 
Now, does it surprise you at all to hear a ballad like that with that particular record cover? Um, what did you, what did, do we have any thoughts on Central Park West? Uh, love to hear them. It's a, well, I guess it's a nice sweet ballad, but you hear some of the chord changes that we've been hearing in some of the other faster pieces. Uh, so it almost has a bit of a connection there for me. Um, I guess on the subject of the album cover, I wondered if Atlantic was trying to get even with them for leaving or, uh, <laughs> or, or they just couldn't use his picture due to contract limitations. <laughs> Yeah, Lou, go ahead. Yeah, certainly that that ballad is somewhat unexpected. Certainly different from the cover. Uh, interestingly, though, it was recorded, but the whole album came from the same time period as Giant Steps, from the same mm -hmm. recording session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it it, um, it reflected what was going on in his mind in those few days during which they recorded several or the equivalent of several albums. Yeah. Um, certainly different from Giant Steps, but uh, again, it was part of what he was feeling and experiencing at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I always find that so fascinating, and particularly in the, uh, the disconnect, um, temporally speaking, you know, the disconnect mm -hmm. uh, between the, rec the recording session and, and that particular date um, of release, because I mean, Coltrane had moved on to other things at that point. He was doing, I mean, he had added a, a member to his group. He had, you know, fired the bass. Well, not fired, but he, <laughs> um, Steve Davis had left the band at that point. You know, this, this was very, this was a different thing. So for, um, for this record to, you know, have come out, it, it was uh, somewhat of a departure. Um, and so I think... Um, yeah, you have, it's a very sweet ballad, but you do hear absolutely, you know, echoes of giant steps and, you know, you also hear the kind of the pedal point from my favorite things, you know, he's just using the pedal point in a different way. So whereas he was using the pedal point in my favorite things to create dissonance, he's using it here to create warmth and to create this ballad, um, kind of texturally speaking. So very interesting um use of a of a pedal point there um any other thoughts on on the ballad central park west i'll say lastly as a saxophone player you know you can really hear coltrane's soprano playing maturing like you can, you can hear that this is something that he's taking very seriously. Um, <clears throat> you can hear it really, and again, it's not, it's not the four years later. It's the same sessions as Giant Steps and My Favorite Things. But you know, I would imagine as you get used to the instrument, as you get used to recording, um, it, something like this, uh, something as beautiful as this and stunning, uh, can come out. So, yeah lovely soprano saxophone ballad, Central Park West. Um, any last thoughts here? Um, I did see you unmute, Louis, so I did just want to make sure. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about the uh, early 60s now. Um, uh, Giant Steps is out on the market. A uh, few more will follow. Did the quartet travel and tour? they tour a lot to promote the albums? Well, you know, in terms of what Coltrane was doing a lot, um, he was kind of a mainstay, and his quartet was really not limited to gigs in New York City, but it was formed for gigs at the famous Jazz Gallery. Now, interestingly enough, I think really, honestly, his quartet sound comes into its own in the Village Vanguard. And so I, I think really, I mean, yeah, he's touring, but 
really honestly the the big thing that he's doing is ri is experimenting right in New York City um, and that to me is is kind of an interesting kind of again like I said an interesting takeaway and that's not to say that he didn't tour um, but to me where the where the where the band really gelled is where he was having these multiple night residencies that we'll talk about next week uh, at the Village Vanguard, and it's really happening right there in New York, and and kind of part of the magic of the uh, the New York City scene at the time. It's such a great question. All right, so I want to preview a little bit of next week for you. Ah, uh, shoot, here we go. So we're going to talk about the Impulse Years, which are also you know also the the sixties. Uh, he adds a second horn, the great Eric Dolphy. Uh, Reggie Workman joins the group, albeit temporarily. He's later replaced by Jimmy Garrison, but we'll get to that. And then he's Coltrane is influenced increasingly by ragas and modal jazz and free jazz. Oh, my. Um, and then uh, much, much more as we continue our exploration of John Coltrane and all of his music. Um, I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, you can't have a class without the class. So um, I just, I'm so grateful for the opportunity again to uh, present to my wonderful, wonderful friends here at HASP. Um, and uh, we will see you all next week as we conclude our deep dive into the music of John Coltrane. Thank you so much, thank Jordan, you. for giving of your time and your talent, especially in this confusing time for you from one place to another and we really appreciate all the preparation and the time and the and the interest that you give us so thanks very much oh thank you all i you know it's it's absolute pleasure have a great week and i hope to see everybody back next week with bells on as we discuss the later coltrane years thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Take care. We'll see you next week.